Welcome back to this week's episode of The Emily Show. It has been a busy, busy week in court, and this is being recorded while we are still on verdict watch. The jurors went home on Friday before the Memorial Day weekend after deliberating just about two hours. It would have been wild if they'd come back with a verdict. I didn't really expect them to, but wouldn't it have been crazy? So we are waiting to see. I don't know if there will be a verdict before this episode comes out or not. If there is, I will try to do a little update um, to tag onto the episode. But if you are not following me around social media, this is the time. Warning. Now is the time when we are on Verdict Watch. I'm at the Emily D. Baker all over the internet. Um, I can't believe this trial's over. It has been a hundred years and three seconds all at once. There is so much that happened in week six because not only did we finish a case, Amber Heard's case in chief, we had another motion to dismiss. We had other motions. We had witnesses get vortiered. We had clap back like TikTok worthy moments. We had a two full rebuttal cases and then closing arguments, which are getting their own episode. Don't you worry. Closing arguments deserves its own moment. It's my favorite part of any trial. For all of you who have found um, me, this podcast, and my YouTube channel during this trial, thank you. It has been a tremendous pleasure and an honor to get to kind of talk through this trial with all of you. It's just been absolutely my pleasure. So thank you for choosing to spend weeks and weeks and weeks with me talking about this case. Let's break down everything that happened in week six. For those of you that might not have had the time to watch, you know, gaveled gavel coverage of this case, which is why I do these breakdowns. So now it's time for a breakdown. Emily, are you in vogue? No, I'm not nearly that good. Never gonna get it, never gonna get it. Hey there. If we haven't met yet, I'm Emily D. Baker, the badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator. I'm the host of The Emily Show, and I break down the legal shit behind the news and pop culture stories we all want to talk about. I have been a licensed attorney for over 15 years, but this is not legal advice. I should warn you, I'm a big fan of the cursey words. This channel is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not fuckery. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Backbone. This device is one of the coolest little pieces of tech I have seen. It turns your mobile phone into a gaming console experience. You can play PlayStation and Xbox games. You can play Apple Arcade and Google games that have controller support. You can also plug in headphones to it so you can hear your game and it has charging support and it has support for screen capping and streaming your handheld gameplay. I have been needing to decompress. It's been busy, y'all. It's been busy. And I love some casual gaming. I've really been enjoying playing Badland Party with my backbone from Apple Arcade. I've not been able to play the Apple Arcade games that have controller support until now. And it's really been a lot of fun. So if you want to check it out for yourself, now is the time. Go to playbackbone.com slash now to order your backbone until June 30th and get free access to over 350 console games and perks including one month free of Xbox Games Pass Ultimate, one month free of Apple Arcade, two months free of Google Strata Pro, and three months free of Discord Nitro. Find your next adventure at playbackbone.com slash lawnard. And if you're asking if I'm hiding this in my office so my kid stops taking it from me, yes, I am. It lives in my office now. Let me know what games you're playing with your backbone. It's been so much fun. We should get back to today's episode. We kicked off week six, still in Amber Heard's case in chief. That means where she is still proving her counterclaim and trying to defend against Johnny Depp's defamation claim. So that began on day 20, Monday, May 23rd. With Dr. Richard Moore, who is an ortho hand and upper extremity expert, live witness, came in hot in the morning talking about the finger injury. There was no heads up before very big, very graphic finger photos were all up on the interwebs in our face. 
But this doctor testified that he believed that the way that Johnny Depp's finger was injured was by the mechanism Johnny Depp originally testified to, that it got slammed in a sliding door. And that's what pinched off the bottom of the finger, but left the fingernail intact. And that something being thrown, something hard being thrown and squishing the finger between something else that's hard um, would have damaged the fingernail and there's no fingernail damage even though the injury came from the side. Don't worry, there's rebuttal witnesses for all of this, and we'll we'll talk about all of that when we get to the rebuttal cases. But it was his testimony that the finger was pinched, and that's how you ended up with that injury, with the tip of the finger being gone. Interestingly enough, what he didn't talk about was the fact that during this trial, Amber Heard's story for what happened to Johnny Depp's finger was that it was likely that it happened when he was smashing a phone to smithereens against the wall. That was just not addressed, which was really interesting because it's like, wait, are we? So they're saying that it happened by a sliding door, not a vodka bottle, but they're not addressing the phone smashing at all, which is interesting because even Amber Heard's own witness the previous week, her acting coach said that she was told by Amber Heard that the finger was injured by Johnny Depp himself with a bottle. So there's lots of different stories about how the fingers gotten injured from team Heard. So that was the first witness at the beginning of week six. Dr. Spiegel was the second witness and wiped out everything else that happened that day because he was just wild. He was wild. I tried to give the man a chance. He came all into court looking like either Doc from Back to the Future or Dr. Duvenschmertz, depending on which franchise you like better. And his testimony seemed to diagnose Johnny Depp with either narcissistic personality disorder or at least narcissistic personality disorder traits and with some substance abuse issues, which I think this trial as well established that Johnny Depp uses substances a lot. Rum never gets mentioned, which is always disappointing to the audience at home, but uh, whiskey more so, which is, you know, all right. Lots of substance use. We're well aware. So by week six, this doctor coming in and going on and on about substance use was odd. Then he started to testify about um, IPV and, and domestic violence and the risk factors for that. And it was very repetitive with Dr. Hughes's testimony, but it seemed based on um, Depp's attorney Dennison doing a voir dire of this expert that this expert was not originally designated in this way and that they were adding more information um, to what this expert was originally designated for. It seemed like his area of expertise was more in the substance abuse realm, but got very deeply into um, IPV. Now on direct examination, it was curious how he was getting into some of these perceptions about Depp when he clearly hadn't evaluated in person or spoken to Depp or anything like that. So basing all of his information off of records and the chat just blew up with this guy is doing things that are not okay. His, his testimony as a psychiatrist seems to go outside the bounds of ethics for the profession seems to violate the Goldwater rule, which we will get into more with the rebuttal expert, but Dr. Spiegel's testimony on direct, though not great, did not get off the rails until cross-examination with Dennison. On cross-examination, Depp's team has a attorney that seems to be designated to deal with experts, Dennison, and he got up for cross-examination and it just, it jumped the track so quickly. And the moments have been memed across the internet. And again, experts are paid to be here. They generally testify in court frequently. So where the parties are in this because this is what happened in their lives. The experts have accepted a paycheck to be here. So though I don't love the memeing of Amber Heard's uh, testimony and tales of her own abuse, people can choose to do that. It's just not my cup of tea. When it comes to the experts, they know what they're getting in for and they choose to be there. And I don't have the same, quite the same, um, uh, hesitancy when it comes to memification of an expert like this expert who did some other things that just turned me against him immediately. Once we got into cross-examination, he was kind of a mess on direct, but once we got into cross, I'm like, I can't with this, I can't with this 
doctor. And you just need, you just, we're just going to go to one little clip of it. But the judge admonished this expert like three or four times. At one point, this expert, the judge is like, just answer the question. And he's like, I'm just, I'm just getting into it here. And I'm like, what do you mean you're getting into it? Are you getting into care? What is happening? You're the expert. And then he, he's being questioned. And at one point he looks at Dennis and is like, I'm not sure why we're debating psychiatry. I told you what it is. And I was like, oh shit, this is going to go badly. And then we ended up with this moment. So for those of you listening, um, you will hear Dennison speaking first, and then you will hear the expert. You will not get the visual that goes with it. This will be timestamped in the video on YouTube. If you just want to go see it though. Purported cognitive impairment. Yes. What do you use as a baseline? A baseline for processing speed? Yeah, for for analyzing Mr. Depp before you watched his deposition. What do you use a baseline for that? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I guess my baseline would probably be what I how I've seen him interact in public. I have seen him interact with others. I've seen him interact in media. I've seen him interact all, and his process speed is certainly not slow. I've seen him do commercials. His process speed was not slow. At deposition, didn't you say that what you did was compare Mr. Depp's performance in lots of pirate movies against his deposition testimony what here? I, what I said was I've seen Mr. Depp do apology ads. I remember he did apology ad with Bad Dog with no delay in process speed. I've seen him interact with the media regarding to that. I saw no delay in processing speed. All I'm saying Let me ask you about pirates though. You compared pirates to the tech uh, to to the depositions given then in this I, case. And I apologize for what I said. Then I misspoke. You misspoke you didn't make the comparison? Right now just a second ago? Just a second ago I I may have said that I misspoke. I apologize. I misspoke. Okay. Because you know you can't compare pirates to sworn testimony, right? Yes. Okay. But you I, can. But as an aside, you can judge someone's processing speed at any time. Like I'm judging yours right now. You're judging mine. We all judge processing speed as a baseline because of what we know about each other. I would say your process speed right now is not slow. So, Thank I you. mean, we're judging processing speed, I'm just saying to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but no, any of Mr. Depp's other portrayals in movies, did that affect your analysis of processing speed? Only I've seen him interact w on interviews, right. and that was it. Right. When he wasn't in movies. What, right. But Willy Wonka doesn't matter to you? You, you see him in that movie, Charlie and Chocolate Factory? Did you look at that one when you were comparing his processing speed? Is, is that, do I have to answer that question, Your Honor? You have to answer questions. Yes, sir. No, you'll be happy. No, I didn't see Willy Wonka. As a, as, I didn't <sighs> see 21 Jump Street when it happened, whatever it was. About. No, I did not. Oof. All right. And that's just a little taste of what this testimony was like. This doctor seemed to compare Johnny Depp on media interviews and in movies and advertisements to what they saw, he saw in Johnny Depp's video deposition and his other doctor notes to assess his uh, mental impairment or any mental impairment from drug use and then the cross-examination kept going because this doctor had referred to Depp as an idiot in his deposition. He tried to walk it back and then was confronted with his testimony. No, you said, oh, so what I'm saying is he's an idiot. And this just, this doctor lost, I think, all credibility with me, likely with the jury and definitely with the audience when he's trying to compare roles where actors are edited and rehearse and have multiple takes to determine his mental acuity and whether his mental acuity had been impaired by drug and alcohol use. It was such a mess. And then they got into the photo of Johnny Depp where he's asleep with a hand in his pocket or passed out or on the nod. The, the words have been very, 
varied during this test uh, trial and then testimony with an ice cream spilled down his lap. And he's like, oh, I was told it was vomitous. So this doctor is like, no, I was told that it he just had puke down him. It was wild. And I think it goes to show that this doctor is just inputting whatever um, team heard has told him and not really questioning it much more, which was a very interesting moment. And it just was such wild testimony with so many, I can't believe this is happening moments that it was hard to pay attention to the next witness, Catherine Arnold, who was worthy of attention because Catherine Arnold gave at least two Aquaman spoilers. And I got into a conversation with the chat and then later on Twitter about whether they're spoilers, if they're consistent with the comic books. But for all of us that aren't deep into the DC comic world, I think it's fair if they're talking about the plot of the movie and the movie hasn't been released yet. And they're talking about plot, potential plot changes that happened um, in the different scripts that I think we can call those spoilers. The movie's not out yet, even if they're consistent with the comic books. That's what I'm going with. I felt like they were spoilers. I'm not going to give them here. <laughs> if you want to go and see whether or not there are Aquaman spoilers in this testimony, it is time stamped on my YouTube channel. Catherine Arnold was the entertainment industry consultant who was giving damages information with regard to the trajectory of Amber Heard's career. She picked comparable careers to Amber Heard and said, look, if you look at the trajectory of these careers, we can forecast the things that Amber Heard would have likely gotten had it not been for the statements made by Depp's former attorney, Adam Waldman. She picked Jason Momoa, Gail Godot, Zendaya, Chris Pine, and Anna de Armas. And so those are the um, actors that she picked to compare the trajectory of Amber Heard's career too. She talked a lot about the star is born moment. And she said that the op-ed to, you know, to Depp's defamation suit didn't damage Depp's career. Depp kind of wrecked his own career and that the op-ed had very little impact because nobody knew about the op-ed until the lawsuit was filed, which is interesting because all of these experts, because there are counterclaims, have a double-edged sword that they have to deal with. Because if no one knew about the op-ed in the Washington Post, then how did enough people know about the statements from Adam Waldman that were in the Daily Mail UK? How 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 is one right and the other one's wrong? And that is the difficulty for all of the damages experts in this case called by both sides. It's that double-edged sword. Well, you can't predict how much they would have lost. You can only calculate the actual contracts that were lost. That goes both ways. And that's kind of the, the line that this uh, expert was trying to walk. The expert talked about the original script and how much was in the Aquaman script and that that script got pared down and then said at the end that they believe that the range of loss for Amber Heard was 45 to $50 million, assuming that in three to five years, her career is able to bounce back from those Waldman statements. And that was the end of the day. On cross-examination, it became a pop quiz um, kind of a pop quiz about the movies and what movies do you know? And do you know that Chris Pine was Captain Kirk and Jason Momoa is Aquaman and Gal Gadot is Wonder Woman? And he says Zendaya has been acting since the Disney Channel and she goes by one name and said Zendaya, not Zendaya. Zendaya. <laughs> so Zend I went and I scoured the internet. It didn't take long. Zendaya pronounces her name Zendaya. All of the attorneys in this case pronounced her name Zendaya. It's Zendaya. So just so we're clear on that point, she goes by one name and is a queen. And I love the Spider-Man movie so much. I think she's a delight. And so it was it was funny to see her name come up so much and the chat being like, put some respect on her name. It is Zendaya. Stop fucking it up, people. And so that was that was pretty funny as we're yelling at the attorneys to get her name right. But either way, the chat in the live stream all agreed that these actors were perhaps not um, comparable to someone who was supporting cast. And we saw that come up in the rebuttal case. And as I said, as I jumped the gun before I got to the cross-examination, that was the end of Heard's case in chief. So when we started the day on Tuesday, May 24th for day 21, we started with the motion to strike with Ben Chu arguing that there's not sufficient evidence on the counterclaim and that the counterclaim itself should be stricken. Uh, Rottenborn said, no, Waldman's, 
Waldman was clearly Depp's agent. And as the attorney and identified in the publications as Depp's attorney, therefore his statements can be attributed to Depp for the counterclaim. The court denied the motion to strike on the counterclaim and said that the court cannot reject any reasonable inference and all the evidence gets viewed in the light most favorable to the other side. And that's standard with, that's the standard. I mean, that's standard because it's the standard. That's the standard. And that's appropriate. I think that Judge A was very much leaning in to let these go to the jury. I don't see how this counterclaim survives. I think it's going to be a really difficult counterclaim with this agency theory. Um, but we'll see what this jury decides to do. And then before the witnesses were called, the YouTube channel hit 500,000 subscribers on Tuesday morning. I still don't have words for it. I don't, I just, I, what? <laughs> it's just wild. Then we got into Depp's rebuttal case. Now, this is standard in cases. You have your case in chief and your witnesses, and then the other side's case, and then the rebuttal witnesses. And there were a few sir rebuttal witnesses for Amber Heard. The first one was Walter Hamada, the president of DC-based films for Warner Brothers. It was very surprising to see such a large executive testifying via video deposition um, in a case like this. It was refreshing. It was I was happy to see it. But Walter Hamada coming back to back on the damages expert for Heard really undercut a lot of what Heard's damages expert said and said that Heard's role as Mira was not reduced, that her compensation wasn't impacted by any statements in any way, and that Heard and Momoa didn't have a lot of chemistry, that the chemistry in the first movie is, he said, movie magic and editorial, and that you can fabricate it in post, but in this film it took a lot of effort, which I imagine was kind of an ego crush moment in court. Um, nobody would like to hear someone that's the head of a studio say that about them. On cross-examination, he was asked about Jason Momoa fighting to keep Amber Heard in the movie, but it seems that the Waldman statements were irrelevant to WB and that some of the issues with this, um, with the role of Mira and her as an actress were the lengths that it took to make it work in post. That's what I took away from that testimony. Um, and that Johnny Depp didn't reach out to try to have her fired. It does seem that Johnny Depp reached out to WB um, to talk about, hey, there's going to be, ba this is the backlash that's coming um, based on what we're going through in this UK suit, which makes sense. He had a relationship with WBN, wanted to, you know, I think maintain that relationship as best as he could. We then got Dr. David um, Kolber, a plastic and hand surgeon at Cedar sinai who treated Depp in LA, talked about the injury and the infection, talked about the treatment that Depp received and the fact that he was in a splint where his middle finger and ring finger were splinted together. He called it a soft cast, but it was plaster over the top and underneath those fingers and then wrapped together. So it was open on the side for swelling. Um, he talked about the infection to the finger and then was asked if Depp could like grab something with that hand. And he said, well, his pointer finger and thumb are still free. So you can kind of pinch at something on cross-examination. It was asked about whether it was a hard cast if you could hit something with the hard cast and the doctor said, well, that would probably have hurt and it could have damaged the cast on a redirect. He was asked if the cast was ever damaged and he said, no, not that I recalled, but it would have been damaged if you had hit something with it. This is all going to whether or not Johnny Depp hit Amber Heard while he was wearing this cast and the doctor's testimony calls that into question. The next rebuttal expert was Richard Marks. This is the lawyer we heard from several weeks ago, the one who did all the really cool deals, the Hollywood dealmaker guy that got the merch deal or was doing the merch deals for Star Wars. Just a fascinating career. He was rebutting the testimony of Arnold and said that he was distinct from Arnold because he works in the industry. He does deals. He still actively does deals. He said, again, Zendaya goes by one name, like, there's no, that's not a comparable actress. Jason Momoa is Aquaman. That's not a comparable actor. That star is born moments like Arnold was testifying to don't often happen to supporting cast. But the thing that was most important for me is that he said, if you're having this kind of moment where everything's blowing up, you would expect to see quite a lot of opportunity come in. 
And he said there was 16 months between Aquaman coming out and those statements made by Adam Waldman. And in those 16 months, we just didn't see a flood of activity. So trying to assume that every movie after Aquaman is going to be a multi-million dollar role, that you're going to get a million dollars per episode for television just isn't, um, just isn't supported by anything. And then on cross-examination, he got asked quite a lot about whether or not he does deals on superhero movies. And he was like, I've done deals for these actors, um, lots of actors that, you know, TV shows and things that are coming up on Apple plus, but he's like, no, I've done fantasy movies and named some very large films, but said, I don't remember my, I've had so much of a career. I don't remember if I've done any specific superhero movie deals. They were trying to distinguish that superhero movies like Aquaman were somehow different and the career trajectory was somehow different. Um, I don't know if that landed with the jury. It definitely didn't land with me. Next was Michael Spindler, the forensic accountant. He really was going again to rebut Arnold Hurd's expert and saying that there was no, there were no maths there. <laughs> there were no facts there. It was speculation and that all of the projections were speculative based on what Amber Heard had in her contract from WB for Aquaman. But again, backing up the other testimony that you might do a big budget film and then an independent film and that it's not linear, but there was nothing on the books that she lost and no way to project out that many damages. Next witness was Doug Banya, the social media expert who was reviewing Mr. Schnell's analysis. Mr. Schnell's the one that the, the hashtag analysis on hashtag justice for Johnny Depp and hashtag Amber Turd and hashtag Amber Heard is an abuser. I still can't believe that all of that came into court in front of this jury, but it sure did. His testimony that kind of stuck with me was that Schnell's tweets that he reviewed over 35% of what was reviewed was from before the Waldman statements were released. So how could they have been related to the Waldman statements if they happened before? There was a brief cross-examination about process. I think Doug Banya knew the assignment, man. He was like, that's not what I was asked to look at. That's not what I was asked to look at. I was only asked to look at this. I'm not testifying to damages. I was asked to look at the tweets. This is the problem I see with you know, the other experts process. This is the problem I see with the timing. This is the problem I saw with the tweets. When I evaluated these tweets, they don't seem to go to the statements. They don't seem to be correlated to the Waldman statements in any way. Next witness woke everybody up in the courtroom because there was a voir dire of the witness. That means a questioning of the witness before the court decided if the witness would be allowed to testify as a rebuttal witness, the witness was allowed to testify. And that witness was Morgan Knight from the Hicksville trailer palace. The incident in Hicksville um, was testified to by a lot of different witnesses. The testimony from Amber Heard and friends is that uh, Johnny Depp got angry because Amber Heard was close to someone or someone put their arm around her and he's like, that's my woman. And then there was an incident and then he grabbed somebody's wrist and said, I know how many pounds of pressure it takes to break a wrist and then trashed the particular trailer they were staying in. If you have not looked online at the Hicksville trailer palace, it looks like a very cool place to go stay. It was also in the, um, was it a Hulu special? I think it was a Hulu special for the hype house. I think it was hype house. It's a TikTok house. I think it was Hype House. <laughs> One of those TikTok houses had a TV show. They went to the Hicksville Trailer Palace. It seems like a really cool place. Um, so I was fascinated. I was fascinated by this witness. I loved his testimony. I was, I was in. I was just, I wanted to hear his whole life story. I want him to write a book. I wanted to know everything. He also has another um, place also near Joshua Tree, I believe, called the Bud and Breakfast. It's like a weed-themed um, and weed tourism location. He said that he was inspired by the Madonna Inn in California, and each trailer at the Trailer Palace is a different theme and restored trailers and kind of like really cool 1950s trailers. He talked about the damage to the trailer. He was the owner at the time, and after the trailer was trashed, as testified to by Amber Heard, there was $62 worth of damage because a light fixture had to be replaced, but to have matching light fixtures in the trailer, they had to replace two of them. He also said that they regularly charge a cleaning fee that he called a piggy fee and that that was not charged to Depp or anyone in his party. He talked about the fact that Amber Heard was the one who seemed jealous that evening, not Johnny Depp, and that Amber Heard was being aggressive towards Johnny Depp and he seemed to withdraw and get quieter. And then cross-examination started a line of cross-examining 
that we saw coming in um, this day and then in later days of, you know, that this is being televised, right? You know that there's cameras in the courthouse, right? And then it all just kind of went downhill from there. And we're going to take a look at that now. Mr. Knight, you are a pretty big fan of Johnny Depp, aren't you? I am not. To be honest, uh, throughout the evening, I... Uh, I sorry, I, I just asked you one question. Oh, I, I, I didn't apologize. ask you the rest of that. I you apologize. wanted to... You can hear the laughing from the audience and they're kind of shushed by the bailiff. This is Herd's attorney, Elaine Bredehoff, questioning Mr. Knight. But it started out with your big fan of Johnny Depp. He's like, eh, <laughs> not so. Participate in this trial, didn't you? I did not. I you was knew? asked by the attorney and I wanted to, they um, asked me and I said, I'll be happy to come and tell the truth. You knew this was on camera, that it was being broadcast to a lot of people and you saw testimony, did you not in this case? And you seized the moment and responded to the umbrella guy, the lead person for Mr. Depp's Twitters. Did you not? <laughs> First of all, I love that Elaine Bredehoff calls it Mr. Depp's Twitters. Second of all, if you do not follow uh, the YouTube sphere a lot, um, Tug or that umbrella guy is a um, anonymous kind of faceless YouTuber. There's lots of them on the platform that has been talking about this case for years, the ins and outs, um, inconsistencies in the evidence in this case, and has a YouTube channel and Twitter that goes through that. But it was very interesting that a, you know, a YouTube creator who has talked about this um, and talked about Johnny Depp and justice for Johnny Depp for years before this case has now found his way into the courtroom um, through Amber Heard's attorneys. It was, it was just an, a surreal moment where again, we see how much the internet is really a factor in this case. And the internet has played a factor in this case. We've seen hashtags come into testimony and now we're seeing a creator um, being discussed by, you know, Amber Heard's attorneys in trial. It's surreal. And I actually feel bad because there's a that umbrella guy and the umbrella guy and Elaine Bredehoff kind of calls them both. And I saw before I recorded that, um, that umbrella guy was having to say, please stop harassing the umbrella guy. I am that umbrella guy. I'm the one that was referenced in court. Can you please leave the other accounts alone because they are not the ones being referenced by Elaine Bredehoff in this testimony. It's kind of funny though. And we're going to get into this just, just a little bit more because it was the, the, the lead, <laughs> the lead Twitters for Depp. It just, and that drew an objection, and that's where we're resuming this. Objection, Your Honor. Argumentative compound. Oh, overruled. Uh, Mr. Umbrella Guy is the lead. The lead. You one. know that he is. He leads one of the most predominant pro depth Twitters out there. I have no idea. I don't care or follow the Umbrella Guy. In fact, you do follow. A Twitter called Johnny Depp fan, don't you? Absolutely not. You don't? That's your testimony no. under oath? It is my testimony under oath. All right. And on April 21st, Mr. Depp testified in this case about Hicksville, didn't he? I wasn't here. And a little bit later in the testimony, we, Elaine is not moving on from the umbrella guy, that umbrella guy, or Mr. Umbrella Guy. And it comes up again. Now... So you reached out to the umbrella guy in this text, this Twitter, right? I wouldn't call it reaching out. He subtweeted him. And in fact, he said it's a subtweet. The umbrella guy is in Mr. A Mr. Adam Waldman. Do you know who Adam Waldman is? I have no idea. Well, he's testified earlier that he talks to the umbrella guy. That um, he what? He talks to the umbrella guy? Yeah. Were you aware of that? I honestly, this sounds like a like schizophrenia okay now for and i think that's what being on cross-examination feels like because elaine i don't think grasps twitter and tweeting and subtweeting and 
this is part of her questioning. It's the way she talked in closing too, where this witness is like, what do you mean this person Waldman talks to an umbrella guy? What are you talking about? I don't follow you. And that's where we get those moments in court where Elaine's getting clapped on by witnesses, but we're not done with that. There, that's that's going to happen more. But we're not done with the rebuttal witnesses yet. After Morgan Knight's testimony, which I thought was very, very interesting because this is a witness who was just like, look, I remember Johnny Depp coming to where I worked. And it was a really fun day because in the the live stream chat, we were talking about celebrities that have come into your work. And people are like, this celebrity came into my work 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. And this was my memory. It was really fun to see people sharing their memories of having celebrities come into their place of work. Way, way back in the day when I worked at Sports Chalet, we would have the occasional celebrity or um, athlete come in and you remember those days at work because it's so out of the ordinary that somebody kind of steps out of the TV or off of the movie screen and is just at your regular place of work. So I don't doubt this individual's testimony at all. It came across as very credible. And he was like, I really don't want to be involved with this at all. Um, but here we are. I said I would come in and tell the truth. And that's what I'm here for. Then we got into Dr. Richard Shaw, who's a psychiatrist, who is uh, a Brit, who is lived in New Zealand or vice versa and had the most lovely accent. He sounded like vision um, from the Marvel movies. And he came and explained the Goldwater rule regarding ethics and was rebutting Dr. Spiegel. He was really fascinating testimony, but I think maybe we didn't need all of it because Dr. Spiegel was such a mess, but the jury can't just go on. That guy was a mess. So you do need that rebuttal testimony, but his testimony was easy to understand. And he went about explaining ethics and psychiatry and why, and talking about diagnosing people from what you've seen on television or in public events with public figures is stigmatizing and unethical. Then we got Jennifer Howell's deposition. I think a lot of people were really looking forward to this particular testimony because a declaration of Jennifer Howell has been widely available in the public uh, since the UK case, where she calls out Amber Heard's sister, Whitney, for lying. But that's not what we got in this video deposition. It was much shorter. And she said, I sent an email to Whitney because I love someone and I knew that they were doing something very wrong to protect their sister. And that's about all we got from Jennifer Howell. Why the entire context of the email to Whitney didn't come in, why the things Whitney told her didn't come in, I will not know. I only can assume that the court ruled things out and that Team Depp fought to try to get more information in based on what's publicly available and that that was denied because it was a very brief, uh, very, very brief video deposition. Then we got into uh, Candy Davidson via video deposition from Children's Hospital LA. The pledge wasn't paid in full as the sum and substance of that testimony. Then proffers were put on the record what proffers are is, hey, Your Honor, you overruled this objection or you granted this objection and evidence didn't come in or you denied this witness or what have you. So on the record, this is what that witness would have said. This is what that testimony was. This is what that document was to preserve it for the appellate court because, hey, it didn't come in. So the appellate court's like, I can't know what they said. This is this is what they would have said. And we learned that there was an expert in policing who had been referenced in opening that wasn't allowed to testify. That was one of the proffers that came up. And then we get to day 22. But first, we need to talk about today's sponsor. I feel like it's officially summer. And one of the things that comes with summer is kids being home and days being longer. And at our house, that means sometimes we forget to start dinner. I mean, the sun is still up and we're like, oh, it's not time to eat yet. And then we're like, oh man, <laughs> it is very much time to eat. And that is where Green Chef has absolutely been a dinner saver for us. Not only is it a premium and organic meal kit, but the meals are really easy and fast to put together and delicious for the whole family. You also have a ton of different eating options to choose from. So you can pick whether you want a gluten-free um, meal plan or vegetarian or vegan or paleo or keto, or you just are looking for more balanced meals. I love how easy they are to put together. Everything's color-coded, which works so well for me. The kids can help make dinner 
and it is the most sustainable meal kit. So you know that while you are looking to eat well, you are also doing well by the planet. So if you are ready to try some easy to put together delicious dinners, just go to greenchef.com slash emilybaker130 and use code emilybaker130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. That's right. Greenchef.com slash emilybaker130. Not only are you getting a great discount, but you're also supporting the show. So go find out for yourself why Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. On day 22, the day started with Kate Moss in a very brief video link testimony where she said that she was on vacation with Johnny Depp and it had been raining and she slipped downstairs and injured herself pretty substantially, was screaming, was in a lot of pain, and that he took care of her, uh, picked her up, got her help, that he never pushed her down the stairs, that she slipped, and that was it. There was no cross-examination. So Kate Moss, no cross happened at the beginning of day 22 on Wednesday, May 24th. The next rebuttal witness was Dr. Shannon Curry. I was very excited to see Dr. Curry back. I quite liked her testimony the first time and liked it just as well the second time. Um, she she came in blazing with, I'm here to rebut Dr. Hughes's testimony, um, but didn't make it personal. She talked about Hughes's diagnosing Amber Heard without some of the tests that are considered the gold standard in the area. She talked about um, about the way that Dr. Hughes administered the tests, the difference between a forensic setting and a clinical setting and the different goals of the two, and, and again, broke down uh, the rebuttal here and really stuck to that. Dr. Hughes testified with a lot of facts or a lot of things that were told her presented as facts. And I think Dr. Curry did a great job of breaking that down um, because it's one of the things that was off-putting really about Dr. Hughes's testimony is it's, well, this was said. So that's the, that's what happened. It's like, "Mm, that's not really what your expert testimony is for though. On cross-examination, Dr. Curry was not asked about muffins, but was again asked about dinner. And she said something that has kind of stuck with me in that she said that she had never had someone she was working with that was essentially homebound by fame. And I thought the phrasing of that was really interesting. But based on all of Johnny Depp's testimony, that is the sense I got too, that he is almost trapped, not almost, is trapped by his own fame. And it's something that I've not thought about very much in my life. And I don't know if a lot of us have, Um, but he talked about in his testimony, trying to go out to dinner and being disruptive and not wanting to be a problem. Like he didn't want him being him in the world to disrupt everyone else around him because he's a thing and he can't not be a thing. And if people see him in public, he's a thing and they want to see him and say hello to him and take pictures with him. But that is disrupting wherever he goes. Um, and, and the way she described it saying homebound, um, really brought kind of the human element back around for not just for us in the chat, watching this trial, but hopefully for the jury as well. Um, And that's with both individuals. I don't know um, if it's to that extent for Amber Heard that it is for Johnny Depp, just given the length and and mega stardom of his career. But it was very interesting um, to hear it put that way. And then as Dr. Curry is trying to answer, you hear Elaine say, we're on very strict time here. And it's interesting because day 22 is really where you start to see Team Heard rushing to deal with time because at each side was given 61 hours to try this case, 61 hours and 15 minutes. And it's very clear on day 22, that team heard is running out of time and team heard running out of time might be why this next decision was made. But Johnny Depp was back on the stand in his own rebuttal, not just to talk about the counterclaim um, and the Waldman statements and saying that the only time he learned about the Waldman statements is when he was sued for them, but then to talk about his honeymoon, Um, to talk about the injuries in photos on his honeymoon where he says he had a black eye. That was cross-examined on, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. To talk about never hearing the rumor about Kate Moss before, that he never pushed her, he never heard that rumor until he said Miss Heard grabbed a hold of it. And he talked about his experience going through this and this case and the allegations against him and sitting here listening to the testimony. And at the end of it, he said, this is not easy for any of us. Um, But no matter what happens, I did get here. I did tell the truth. And I've spoken up for what I've been carrying on my back for the last six years. It was a powerful moment um, before 
what I thought was one of the better cross-examinations in this case by Mr. Rottenborn. No love lost between Johnny Depp and Rottenborn, but the cross was very fast. Rottenborn cross-examined him on a number of text messages saying, you said this. And Johnny Depp's like, no. And it's the first time we've seen him say, I didn't say that. Most of the text messages, he's like, I said that, I regret it, but I said it. And it's interesting because the internet was very swift to point out that those messages were marked incoming, not outgoing, different than every other text message in this case that's been admitted into evidence. And so that was a quirk that was never addressed in court, but was addressed on the interwebs. And then he talked about the wall-mounted phone testimony and whether Johnny Depp remembered there being a phone or not a phone. The impeachment wasn't great for me because it was hard to understand what Rottenborn exactly was asking and the questions weren't super clear. And then he brought in photos from before um, Depp and Heard went on the Orient Express that Rottenborn put forth saying, look, you have the same like sunburn or whatever going on with your eye. It's not a black eye. It never was a black eye, um, which is interesting because Rottenborn's position was look at this photo from before and look at this photo now. It's the same. You never had a black eye. You're sunburned or whatever. When Amber Heard testified, she said that the photo was photoshopped. So now there's multiple different theories about what's going on with the photo. I think Rottenborn's argument was stronger. Um, saying, look, these photos look very similar. Johnny Depp tried to back away from that, saying, no, light's different, this and this and that. It was interesting having like spaghetti thrown at the wall in real time with like, it's Photoshop. But if it isn't Photoshopped, it was there before. What? Then um, when they broke for lunch in the middle of Johnny Depp's testimony, the TMZ attorney was heard on a motion to intervene. The day before, on May 23rd, TMZ had filed a motion to intervene to try to block a witness from testifying. That motion was heard very briefly by the court, and the court was like, I'm sorry, you don't go here. You are not a party to this case, and this motion is denied. And the very next witness was Morgan Tremaine from, or formerly from TMZ. Um, Looks a little bit like Draco Malfoy, which was funny because on my YouTube channel, we've been calling Elaine Bredehoft Umbridge. And so we ended up with this witness from TMZ who not only explained how TMZ works and kind of the inner workings, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. I was like, I'm here for all all of this. How do you get tipped off? What's the personal tip line? How do you deal with copyright? How do you decide when and when not to send paparazzi to a location or not? It was fascinating. But the heart and core of that testimony was the leaked video with regard to the cabinets being slammed. And this witness testified to the fact that that video was received edited. The one in court is much fuller and there's, you know, the top and kind of the beginning and end of that video is clipped off and saying that if TMZ had clipped it, they would have put kind of a white flash on it. You would know it was edited and where. So if they're not putting it up and it's full, then it's very clear that it's been edited by them. Um, and they talked about the fact that when they receive, um, videos or photos and things like that, that need copyright, it takes them time to get that copyright unless it's coming from the primary source. And if it's coming from the primary source, it only takes about 15 minutes to verify. And in this case, from the time they were aware of the video to the time it was posted was about 15 minutes, which I thought was very strong testimony that Amber Heard leaked this photo or leaked this video. And the reason it matters is because it was very, very close in time to the deposition um, that she was going to give with Johnny Depp um, with regard to the divorce. Then Cross-examination started much like other cross-examinations. You know there's going to be cameras here. But it gave me one of us, it gave us probably one of um, the highlight moments from this trial when it comes to clapback testimony, and that's here. This is Elaine Bredehoff, cross-examining witness Morgan Tremaine. What video was shown at this trial? Um, I was alerted by a friend that... um that TMZ was being kind of talked about in this trial. And so I had seen a clip of that. So you watched some of this trial? Correct. Okay. When did you first reach out to counsel for Mr. Depp? Um, I believe that was six days ago, whatever that date would be, I'd have to do that. All right. And then you received a subpoena, I think yesterday, in care of your attorney, Cindy Hickox, right? Correct. Okay. And Cindy Hickox represents Christy Dombrowski, Kate James, Robin Baum. Objection, Your Honor. Were you aware calls of Calls for speculation. Oh, overruled. Were you aware of that? Other no. witnesses in this case. Now, if you don't have information that's helpful to this case, then you wouldn't be a witness, correct? Objection. Uh, calls for speculation. 
Sustained. I'm, sustained. Next question. I'm not aware. Right. Okay. You know this. You know this case is being televised, right? I, I am aware that there are cameras. And so this gets you your 15 minutes of fame. Objection, it? Your Honor. Argumentative. I I can ask that question. Oh, ruled. Um, so I stand to gain nothing from this. I'm actually putting myself kind of in the target of TMZ, a very litigious uh, organization, and I'm not seeking any 15 minutes here. Though you may, you're welcome to speculate. I could say the same thing by taking Amber Heard as a client for you. Mm -hmm. A little argumentative, don't you think? Oh, hardly. I find that to be purely logical. Thank now, you. Now, are you aware that Mr. Depp's attorneys were well aware of the TRO? And then that starts to get into an area that is still under contention. Elaine Bredehoff trying to insinuate that Depp's attorneys knew that Amber Heard would be filing the TRO on that day. There's much discussion about how Amber, how those photos came to be of Amber Heard filing the TRO. And this witness actually testified that they knew, or TMZ knew, where she would be coming out of the courthouse and that she would pause and turn so that they could get a picture of the side of her face. That was his testimony. I think he was one of the most important witnesses in the rebuttal case, not just because the, the jury would wake up and pay attention, but because it really undercuts a lot of prior testimony with, you know, no, I didn't alert the media. No, they didn't know. How did they know you were going to pause and turn then? Everyone must be lying for you to be telling the truth in this instant. The next witness was Brian Neumeister, digital forensics, and talked about the photos and the EXIF data from the photos. There was clearly a ruling by the court that limited what this expert could get into. And it was a back and forth, which made this testimony very disjointed because there were lots of objections. But the things that were being objected about, then the door got open to them in cross-examination. Anyway, it was very interesting watching this expert tried to rein down what they were allowed to talk about. I wish we knew what that ruling was so we understood why this witness was so constrained, but was constrained. The most interesting thing that came out, though, were some demonstratives that the jury will not get to take back and consider because they're not evidence, but demonstratives about how some of the photos in this case are literally the exact same photo, even though the testimony was that they were either taken at different times or taken in different light or admitted into evidence for uh, different incidences from different days. How relevant that will be to the jury, we will see. But it was very interesting that, you know, there's testimony that two photos that look the same, but the lighting is all, the, the coloring of the photo is different. But Amber Heard's like, these are different. These happen at different times. And then we get the reveal of some of the metadata because it's testified to that those photos are from the exact same date down to the second. On cross-examination, they went after this expert about his degree and about, you know, you don't have a technical degree in, you know, digital forensic, et cetera, et cetera, but not much headway, I think, was made. The last witness of the day was Beverly Leonard via video link, who witnessed the incident between Amber Heard and her ex at SeaTac Airport in 2009. Um, this witness was very careful to say that they witnessed an incident with Amber Heard and her travel partner, who was two to three inches taller, was in the baggage claim area. The witness said that they worked at SeaTac and they brought over a um, colleague to help because they saw the two women getting into an altercation. They broke up the fight and stopped it from further injury or escalation. She testified that Heard was aggressive, um, that her eyes were glassy, and smelled of alcohol. That should have given me a tip. I should have known what was coming, but I didn't. I didn't put it together at the time. And that Heard aggressively pulled a chain off the travel partner, uh, who I now know to be her ex, her ex-wife, but pulled or ex, I think ex-wife, ex-fiance, but ripped a necklace off of her neck. And then the uh, witness, Leonard, said she saw like a rope burn from the chain. On cross-examination, it was the same thing. You're aware this is being televised. When did you talk to Depp's counsel? And it was late last night. And this witness said, I had wondered why I hadn't been contacted. What the jury did not hear, but what the internet was aware of and shared with me, is that this was the arresting officer from that incident. Again, clear that there was a court ruling that this this witness could not get into the fact that they are a police officer, that they arrested Amber Heard, that they um, arrested Amber Heard after that incident at SeaTac, that they were working in their 
capacity as a police officer, though when I went back and watched the testimony, the way she described her being apparently under the influence was like, oh, yes, obviously. <laughs> obviously, that's a police officer describing somebody who's under the influence and got into an altercation. At the end of the day, Johnny Depp's team had seven hours left. Amber Heard's team had one hour and 16 minutes left with a full day of testimony to go the last day, day 23. And day 23 started out with Dr. Richard Gilbert, who is also a hand and wrist orthopedic surgeon. He was the expert that testified, not the treating doctor, but an expert that reviewed the records and all of the photos and talked about the fact that the injury had clean margins or clean edges, which was consistent with a sharp edge. So again, rebutting the door, the finger got pinched in a door and that's how it you know, lost part of his finger, that it was more consistent with a glass cut and he was rebutting Dr. Moore. And that was Depp's last rebuttal witness. And then we began the frenetic rebuttal of Amber Heard because again, when they started the day, they had an hour and 16 minutes left for all of their witnesses for the day. They started with Julian Eckert, a computer forensic specialist who was rebutting the previous computer forensic specialist talking about the um, metadata and got into a bit of the metadata, talking about the fact that some of the fi- the photos were stored in Photos 3, which is not just an editing program, but was also a storage program. So it's not, you know, we don't know that all these photos were edited. You can't say that all the photos were edited or faked or what have you. Then Dr. Don Hughes was back. Goody. Um, Dr. Hughes was rebutting Dr. Curry, rebutting Dr. Hughes. Dr. Hughes said that the tests weren't flawed. She didn't do the test wrong. On cross-examination, she was asked again, well, look, this, this test that you gave asked Amber Heard to indicate instances of violence. And this test was given well after the two had separated. It was given in 2019 and or 2020, and the two had separated in 2016 and were f- you know, not physically in the same space, at least after early 2017. So she said, well, she was oriented to a different time when giving these responses. And it was things like that, those little like, but you're not following the instructions of the test. So how can the test be valid? That just came up again on cross-examination. Then Amber Heard was called to the stand by her team at the time when this happened. And still now this wasn't a good idea. Ben Rottenborn did not have enough time to protect Amber Heard. I don't know if this was a lawyer decision or a client decision. It was a decision. It was an interesting decision. The cross-examination, again, was very powerful. Camille Vasquez does a great cross. But Ben Rottenborn did a good direct examination of Amber Heard. Better chemistry, I thought, than with Elaine Bredehoff, where it felt like she and Amber Heard were fighting with each other half the time during direct And I think that maybe I would have felt differently about Amber Heard's testimony, at least some, um, had this been the questioning attorney all along. But Amber Heard launched into a very emotional retelling of how harassed and humiliated and threatened she is because of this case. But it was interesting because her testimony got into a lot what's happened since this trial's been going on. When this is supposed to be rebuttal, to the fallout from the Waldman statements. So I don't know if Amber Heard in her mind has conducted the Waldman statements she's suing over all the way to now, but she really talked about what she's going through because of this trial, it seemed, and even said, people are mocking my testimony about being assaulted. Again, the internet coming into this case, now we are aware you know, that Amber Heard is aware that Twitter has been making fun of her testimony And now the jury is too. The jury now knows that hashtag justice for Johnny Depp is more popular than the Amber Heard hashtags and that Amber Heard's um, testimony is being mocked. So if there's jurors that didn't like her testimony, the jurors are going to be like, well, the internet and I are on the same page. If there's jurors who like her testimony, it's going to be, that's horrific. And who would even do that? Though I think you cannot believe all of Amber Heard's testimony and still think it's horrific to be mocked for it. I think there's a room for a third option, but it's introduced more evidence or more more information about the internet to this jury than, than I would have anticipated coming into this case, and it's been surprising. 
So when they talk about the statements, the Waldman statements continuing to manifest in her life, she talks about being triggered. She talks about reliving the trauma. She talks about living with some very strict rules for friends, family, intimate partners, coworkers, um, to make sure that she can work without being triggered. She talked a lot about the campaign against her. Um, she talked about not being able to have a career that people can't associate with her and that she's utterly humiliated. And at the end, she said, Johnny has taken enough of my voice. I have the right to my voice and my name. I have the right to own my story and my truth. I hope to get my voice back. What's interesting to me is she said, I have the right to own my story and my truth. And Johnny Depp in his final words said, I came here and told the truth. And I don't know if that's a distinction without a difference. We'll see what the jury, what the jury thinks. The direct was very, very short because they had to save time for redirect, but then they had to get into cross-examination. And in cross-examination, Camille Vasquez went kind of lie by lie, as she said, and said, the reason this is difficult for you is because your lies have been exposed to the world. And then went through the inconsistencies with different witnesses and went down a line of questioning of, you didn't expect Ben King to come from the UK to testify against you. You didn't expect witnesses like Mr. Knight to come here and testify against you. And Amber Heard's response to a lot of those was, I've heard a lot of people say things to be a part of the Johnny Depp show. People are coming out of the woodwork to support him. People come out of the woodwork to support him. And she said, people will come out and say whatever for him. He's a powerful man. This is why I wrote the op-ed because of this, because people will come out and do whatever for him because he's a powerful man. And it reiterated towards the end of cross-examination that this op-ed was in fact about Johnny Depp and this phenomenon of people protecting powerful men, which is a proposition I don't disagree with. I just don't know if it's all of the story that's at play in this case after seeing all of the evidence. And I think the jury's going to have to sit down and look at all of the evidence, testimony and documents and see where they line up and where they don't. There's been a lot of inconsistencies um, throughout Heard's testimony, but the injuries, the injuries described and the assaults described in the photos shown just don't match. And I think there was a path to victory for Team Heard on this case coming in on the law. And I just think that after all of the evidence is in, I would understand if this jury came back with a verdict for Johnny Depp. Um, I think especially on the uh, the retweet, not the retweet, the, the quote tweet that had more in it, the republication and the online version with that sexual violence headline. I think that's Johnny Depp's best path to victory, but the jury could decide a few things. Let's talk about that real quick. This jury has to come to a unanimous verdict. All seven of them must agree on not just whether somebody's liable for defamation or not, but the amount of damages to grant. And when we talk about closing arguments, I'll talk about damages a bit more, but that will be a separate episode. The jurors can find that no one is responsible for defamation for anyone. All of you are done. Nobody's responsible. Um, no defamation. Just go. They could find that Depp threw Waldman's statements to fame Amber Heard. I think it's unlikely. They could find that Amber Heard threw her op-ed to fame Johnny Depp. I think on the print edition, it's unlikely. I think on the online edition, it's more likely. Um, and then they have to come to an agreement of, of damages, but it's also possible that this jury cannot reach a verdict and we will see how long they deliberate and see what kind of questions they ask and see kind of where their heads are at. And I hope they come back with a verdict liability or not. I hope they come back with a final verdict. I think a hung jury would leave this very much up in the air for everyone involved. And after these parties have been litigating against each other for six years, I hope that there is a final answer from this jury, but we will see, and it is in their hands to decide. So ladies and gentlemen of the law nerd community, we will see what the ladies and gentlemen of the jury decide to do. Thank you for being here for another episode. Thank you for being a law nerd. Thank you for all of your support. If you have questions about this episode, let me know down below. I'm going to be answering them and we're going to do lots of Q and A's as we are on verdict watch. So be sure to let me know what your questions are. And with that, thank you for being here. Make sure to take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and may your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your gas not be $7 a gallon. May your family be well, and may the odds be ever in your favor. Cheers. Thank you for being a law nerd. Bye. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com, happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube.